I'm sure you guys are happy to have, because we have a great person in this on this show today. Um, I'm not going to say his name yet because I'm just going to keep on giving you guys suspense for you to know who is going to be on the field today. This person is actually a management consultant and he also has a knowledge in African investments. You know, he's also an African investment consultant. So, um. On this series, we're going to be talking about um, investing in Africa. That's what we're going to be talking about, investing in Africa. And the main goal of this particular episode is to let people understand the risks and reward, you know, of investing in Africa's economic renaissance. You know, a lot of people have gotten to that, um, that situation there they've thought about okay how can we invest in africa but how do we go about this you know a lot of people just get into that field there they that um thought that they want to invest in africa but they just don't even know how to go about it they don't know they've heard so much media propaganda talking about investing in africa is the wrong idea and right here today we have like i said we have a call doc you know it's going to be uh, yeah, I already give out the name, but you know, so <laughs> so we have a call doc. He's a CEO of a consulting firm in South Sudan. It's called Oros Consulting. It's a management consulting firm. So, um, hello, Mister Call. Brother Jay, how are you? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Good to have you on our show today. It's you know? good to be here. Yeah, yeah, guys. <laughs> All right, good to good to, to have you. So, um. I want to ask, you know, I want you to introduce yourself to my audience and your background as a management consultant, you know, and also an African investment consultant. So I want you to just, you know, let's introduce yourself a little bit. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Akol, Akol Doc. Uh, I'm the managing partner of Oris Consulting Limited. It's a management consultant and investment advisory firm based in Juba, South Sudan. And so some of the things that we do is we do management consulting for clients in the country, such as uh, strategic planning, strategic communications, management consulting, capacity building. And then for uh, clients coming to South Sudan, we advise clients who want to invest in South Sudan on the investment climate, investment strategy, investment policy, and stakeholder engagement and the best way to do that. So I've been doing this for the past six years. I've been very passionate about bringing investment to Africa, not only bringing investment to Africa, but really uh, developing the African private sector. Because I believe that if we really want to create prosperity and opportunity in Africa, we really have to have a robust private sector. That's a, that's a big deal. you know. So now talking about investment in Africa, just like you said, so what are the opportunities you see you know, that can actually um, people that really want to invest in Africa can actually tap on. I think some of the opportunities we have to look at from given overview, of the common problems that occur across African countries, particularly Sub-Saharan. Um, we see that um, there's the gaps in education, in healthcare, uh, in technology, and in trade. Um, a lot of African countries are currently importing a lot of things from the global markets. If you can find a way to encourage Africans to produce things locally, to have stronger economies, to have uh, food security, these things are done through the private sector. So we really mm -hmm. need to tap into Africa's industrial capacity, which is a key component to getting Africa out of poverty. And so mm -hmm. what, would you, what would you would advise an investor wanting to come to Africa is you focus on industries that are high impact and have a low barrier to entry. And if you look at the richest person in Africa, uh, Mr. Liko Dangote, his yeah. businesses are, he has a cement factory, he has a sugar factory, he's doing oil mm -hmm. refinery. He's basically producing things locally. When you have a, when you have in his sugar factory, he now is encouraging sugar farmers to grow more sugar cane, which means mm -hmm. more money is going to those farmers. And when you have an oil refinery, you're now going to 
the crude oil that's being exported can be now kept in the country. So there's a lot of opportunities in trade in Africa. And I think too often in Africa, people come with the mindset that they want to come to Africa and really focus on technology, bring the next app, the next mm. thing. No, we don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the policy there. But what you can do is you can come and focus on very rudimentary and simple uh, projects that can have big impact in Africa. Oh, that's, that's, that's powerful. So and you said something about um, investment, you know, talk about the key sectors. So I want to ask this, you know, a question because you are the, you are the expert here. So what are some key sectors? Because, it, you know, you talked about people trying to set up hubs in Africa. It might not really be um, a good idea. So, but what are some key sectors or industry that you believe hold the most potential for growth and return on investment in Africa? So, what are the key sectors that you can actually suggest as an expert in this field? The key sectors I would suggest, I would break it down into, uh, number one is agriculture. By mm. far, uh, agriculture is where if you, the next billionaire in Africa, I mean, even Dengote is in agriculture, uh, mm. cement, mm. Uh, sugar. Mm -hmm flour mill. These are agriculture um, and energy. Energy. Um, I would say agriculture, energy, and then infrastructure. Uh, the reason I would say those three things because those are the most important sectors and they have the highest demand. If you go to Africa right now and you want to develop an app, a delivery app, for example, like Amazon or the Uber there, you're going to find that some places don't have roads. Some places aren't mapped out. And many people have already been used to used to taking taxi or taking public transport. But if you go to Africa and say, I want to invest and I want to in, in, in a farm that's going to grow grains, sorghum or wheat or a millet, you're going to have a market because everybody's mm -hmm. going to need food to eat. If you go to Africa and you say, I want to sell fuel, I want to build a refinery, you're going to find people that want to purchase fuel. Sure. If you go to Africa and you say, I want to develop uh, agriculture capacities, like let's take a value chain addition from growing the millet to making the flour. You're going to have a demand there because you want to go there as, as an investor and as, as a business mind, you want to make returns on your investment. You're there to make money. Um, yes, you can start to venture into very esoteric and long-term things, but you want to also make money on your investments. And the best way to do that is to focus on industries that have a high demand and have a low risk so to speak low risk so now we talked about low risk i um i demand and low risk so now what i feel like every business even right here in the united states businesses have challenges so what are the challenges or maybe i should say the risks investors would typically face when investing or maybe they're considering investing in Africa because I've had quite a number of um, investors talk about, oh, there's a lot of risk. I don't even want to talk about it. So you as a person, you talked about a very good sector, agriculture, but I feel there's, there should be one or two risks, right? So what are the risks you think, you know, because I know there should be one or two risks, right? So what are the risks you think that, um, an investor might face or would typically face when considering investing in Africa, especially in agriculture? Okay. Risk is everywhere. And I think when you think about risk, you have to see what are things that can destroy or prevent you from succeeding. Um, in Africa, for agriculture, the number one risk, I would say, is um, insecurity in different places. Hmm. Uh, some places are not secure. And you may find that this place has very fertile land, but there's no security. There's no guarantee. There may be rebels, terror groups, or insurgents. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the common theme people have. And yes, it's a reality we have to accept that there's some Af countries in Africa who have had histories of conflict, and you have some rogue uh, militants roaming around in some places. So there's that risk. Uh, the second risk you would say is could be the risk of uh, infrastructure where you can identify a place that has great agriculture potential but how do you take that to markets i mean you have parts and you have countries in africa that have a lot of agriculture potential but their agriculture centers are in places that has no roads or railroads obviously that's that when you go to more institutional risks we're talking about governance where some places don't have strong investment policies mm -hmm. 
Uh, they don't have strong local policies and don't have protection of investment. A lot of people fear going to Africa because the feeling is that, hey, I'm going to go there. Um, the government can just take what I have. They're not going to protect me. I can yes, be scared. There's exactly. not labor laws. There's not security laws. So if your employees are taken from there's nothing. And then like you said last time we were in New York, it's like, okay, what if a new government comes in and they just scrap everything? Hmm. Or what if, you know, like what you're seeing in Africa, what if a coup happens? Hmm. And the new guys, they're yeah. saying, you're old guy. Those are legitimate risk. And the biggest, I mean, in any investment for agriculture, if it's in America, the risk is going to be crops, hmm. uh, weeds, the hmm. rains, um, pesticides, herbicides, those are basic agriculture risks. But in Africa, it goes further because these won't be your risk. Those won't be your, your worries will be other things. Your worry will be, is the government going to protect my investment? Mm. Or are they not going to extort me, ask me for bribes? And people mm. have these legitimate concerns. Am mm. I not going to be asked to be given a percentage of my produce? Mm. Um, am I, if tomorrow, if something happens, if Jay is the minister and he's changed and a new guy comes in, <laughs> is he going to change on me? <laughs> yeah, that's another thing, you know? Yeah. So, but- but when there's a problem, I always believe there's a solution. So what what solution do you see? You know, how can how can you advise investor, you know, um how they can mitigate the risk and you know find a way, you know, and navigate the complexities of investing in Africa. You know, it's a complex, everybody knows the problem, right? But there are still some people that are investing still. So how do we navigate? How do you, what would you suggest the best way for them to navigate the risk, you know? I mean, if you look at it, okay, that's why like legal firms and consulting firms like you and I exist to help them navigate these challenges. Because you may have, because Africa is big, by the way, we have to make that very clear to the listeners. Mm -hmm. You have about 54 countries. Right different culture, different policies, different history. I mean, if you, I mean, just give you a background, like you have countries who, like you have countries who've had a lot of coups recently, but then sure. you have countries who've had a lot of elections and have a very stable political climate. And when you're talking the Botswanas, the Malawis, the Zambia, who have transitioned democratically and not seen violence, then you also have the Central African Republic, you mm-hmm. have the uh, DRC, uh, then you have the, the coup belt, let me say that. Mm-hmm. Mali, Gabon, Burkina Faso, mm-hmm. um, Niger. Mm-hmm. In Niger. It's, yeah. it's the, Africa is so diverse. Mm-hmm. You have powerhouses like Nigeria who themselves mm-hmm. act as if they are a continent. They're very powerful in their own right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you come to East Africa, our side, you have different countries, different policies. You have the mm-hmm. Kenya, you have the Uganda, Rwanda, South mm-hmm. Sudan, Ethiopia, mm-hmm. Eritrea. Uh, Somalia, Tanzania. So every place is so unique. And even sometimes with us, when we cross cross with other projects in other countries, we find that some problems that we have, they don't have and vice versa, right? Mm-hmm. Like somebody's like, oh, you know, we have this problem that we face. I'm like, what problem do you face? Like, oh, we don't have an issue. Like mm-hmm. in South Sudan, we don't have an issue of land, mm-hmm. for agriculture. I mean, many places that it's not a big deal. You can get the land. The community will give you the land even you know, to, to lease it to you, to be growing, and then you have an agreement with the community and give them a percentage. Sometimes, mm-hmm. and the government will yield to the community. The government will say, hey, you guys talk to the community. In other countries, the government just forces and takes it yeah. from the community. Yeah. Different. So the, the, to overcome these challenges, we have to accept that um, we have to know what we're selling to our African people. It mm-hmm. can be, I'm coming to, so it has to come as I'm coming to work as a partner in development, not as somebody coming to help or whatever. Come make your money and get out. Mm. So those are some of the challenges that those are what we can overcome this. Know your environment, know your situation, and learn to navigate it. Don't come and be stubborn. Because the same way in America, I mean, I, I'm in Texas, you're in New York. There's different laws. Yeah. Right now, yeah. if you go to Los Angeles, you, county. you can there's open, even, up, yeah, you can open even, a weed shop. Okay. And like, Texas, you'll get locked up. Yeah, yeah. There's even like county laws. There's like city laws. You know, New York City law is different from when you go to um, Albany or, you know, different county. You, know? yeah, you yeah. go to Buffalo, they have different laws too, but there's the New York State law. I mean, yeah. each city has their own laws, which is understandable. Yes. So if you are not looking at this, okay, you talked about um, there are different countries. You know, you talk about 54 countries, which is good. And you talked about some going through challenges of coup and some have a stable ground. So if I'm going to ask you, as the expert here, are there specific regions 
or countries in Africa that you believe offer particular compelling investment opportunities for people or for investors? For FDI, I would say the stronger economies offer the most opportunity. Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, um, Uganda, Egypt, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. These are countries that you say, okay, they have they have a culture where their economy is growing so much that to facilitate some of the bigger projects that they're doing, they need FBI. I mean, mm. you look at Dangote's refinery. I mean, not all that money came from Africa. Of course. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. people who are interested in investing. I mean, you raised fifteen billion dollars. That's some. That's the GDP of some economies mm. in Africa. Fifteen billion. Um, mm. You have countries that are really positioning themselves in di- different sectors. You look at the Rwanda. What's happening in Rwanda with technology? Rwanda's posi- technology and finance. I would say Rwanda's trying to position itself as the center of technology and finance in East Africa. Currently, it's Nairobi. Uh, you have other countries. Um, who position themselves much differently. If you look at Tanzania, it's not really outward looking, it's more inward looking, where Tanzania focuses on just its local economy and it's not so much about being out there. And then its neighbor Kenya is different. If you have Kenya, the president is so active, the president was here in the UN General mm-hmm. Assembly, is trying to get investment, FDI. Every country is unique. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you have countries uh, like Malawi who produces a lot of agricultural products and their market is Africa and the markets are its neighbors. So when we talk about investment in Africa, let's, th- there's also intra-Africa investment. Like if you're somebody in Nigeria, come invest in South Sudan. If I'm South mm-hmm. Sudanese uh, entrepreneur, business person, I can invest in Kenya. Because when we talk about investors, let's start with ourselves as Africans. Mm-hmm. Uh, like what Dangote did in Zambia. Mm-hmm. Or in Ghana. Yeah, and some in West Ghana. African countries, yeah. Well, it's yeah. Like too often we want to get investment from the east or mm. the west, but let's start with our own investors. Mm. Um, so there's, that's why it's good to understand the different things where, like South Sudan, for us in South Sudan, my home country, um, we're an oil economy. We're meaning we're exporting all of our, we're crude, we're crude exporter, uh, but we don't have an oil refinery. If we were to develop an oil refinery, it's particularly in the area where there's producing oil in the, in the northern upper now area, you'd be able to export this to Ethiopia. And Ethiopia has the second largest population in Africa. That's an investment opportunity right there. Uh, mm. And there's no oil refinery in all of East Africa. Think about that. Mm. That's an opportunity that doesn't need other people. Some Africans can do it. The same thing in, if you look at, even inside like Nigeria, some places produce products, some don't produce products. So, African investment, like I would say the message has to be before we get into the FDI, let's focus on the internal African investment, intra-Africa. And African Bank is doing a very good job of this, is trying to facilitate intra-Africa trade. Wow. That's that's um I like the view how you you know break it down. The intra-African investment is key too. Because if you look at it, you know, if you are not investing on you know with um in the continent, mm-hmm. you know. How would we want people from, you know, African countries, uh, sorry, from Eastern um, Asia or Australia or America to invest in it? So mm-hmm. I remember you talked about something about um, Rwanda, about technology. Mm-hmm. You talked about technology. So now the question I'm going to ask about that is, mm-hmm. what role does technology and digital innovation play in driving economic growth and investment in Africa. Mm-hmm. What role do you think it plays? Looking at the model of Rwanda. Look. I think, okay, before we get into technology, an economy has to have matured a certain level before it starts talking about it, technology. Number one, you need reliable internet. Uh, you need a uh, reliable network. You would have need an educated populace who understands technology. And then from there, you can transition. So when we talk about the role technology is playing, once again, Africa is not a monolith. Uh, Africa in itself is unique. Some African countries right now are focused on food, in food security, become food secure. Some African countries are focused on developing tech hubs or finance for investment. But Rwanda's model is unique where 
they're trying to integrate the technology as the fintech, let me say financial technology aspect into their growth strategy, into the development strategy, where in agriculture, they're introducing drones. They're using uh, different technological things to do with their different sectors. Um, they have an e they have an e-government system mm. where they've used technology to enhance government services, enhance government efficiencies. So that's a very good model in Africa. And I think Rwanda is able to do it because Rwanda is a smaller country. I mean, if you have a country small like Rwanda, you're able to get from one end to the other end quickly. Yeah, definitely. Uh, very yeah. quickly. It's not, I mean, uh, it's... Uh, in Nigeria, if you want to go from Lagos to uh, uh, long drive. Kano, it's going to be a trip. Yeah, it's going to be a long drive. <laughs> yeah, long drive. <laughs> you know, and if you want to go even in the, from, you know, Ibadan to uh, Port Harcourt, you have yeah. a trip. Yeah, so it's, it's a long trip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why it's able to do some of these things. But it's, it's mm. succeeding, succeeding indeed, mm. because it's, mm. it's created a new way where they've embraced technology and it's encouraging other people to do it. And now it's bringing, like, just making robotics. And it's doing a lot of work, a lot of very good work. But that's a model mm. that, once again, when we study Africa, we have to study why something can work in one country and why it cannot work in another country. And why it can't work in that other country and it can work in this country. Mm. Uh, because some of the things that happen in Rwanda in the technology side, I mean, they're able to go to the rural places. I mean, they're able to travel mm. effectively. And yes, they've had their rough history, like many African countries, but they overcame that history. Mm. You know, they 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 really overcome the history, and so it's 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 it's, it's pretty successful so far. Mm. Wow. So now let's take away, let's move away from the Rwanda because you know I've been to Kigali and it's quite uh, a nice city. You know, mm -hmm. so and like the fact you said, it's a small city. You can drive around Kigali in a few hours. You know. Yeah. But it's actually a growing economy, which is very mm -hmm. good. So, mm -hmm. um, a lot of investors, you know, you, no, let me even first go with that um, fact that you said you talked about intra Africa investment. So, if you look at intra African investment, what role do you think local partnership and relationship play in successful investment ventures in Africa? So what role do, you know, we want investment to work, right? So now I'm from Nigeria or I'm from Ghana. I'm trying to invest in, let's just say, South Sudan, you know. Is there a government um, incentive? Like what, 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 would, what would the, is this a, a good landing ground for me as an African investing in Africa compared to, somebody coming from the West to come and invest in Africa? There is, it's a landing ground. I mean, look, when, when you work in Africa and you understand how things work, you're able to go to other countries and, and integrate really quickly. And you're mm. able to speak the language that the people speak. And you're able to do some of the things they don't, that, that other couldn't do, such mm. as Chinese or an American. But I agree with you. That's an aspect that we completely overlook is the inter Africa trade and the local partnerships where you I'll go to a conference and I'll see Africans running after other Africans, but I won't see Africans I mean running after non Africans, but I won't see an African running after another African like uh the the idea is I want to work it's really with weird. You. Yeah, it's like really example, like it's kinda like when we saw New York, it was like, Hey, you're doing this, how can we work together? I meet him like, mm -hmm. Hey, he gets mm -hmm. South Sudan, he you've been to Nairobi, Kampala, Kigali, Lagos, mm -hmm. Accra, Abuja. I'm like, okay, if you come to Juba, you'll get it. You'll know yeah, why things yeah. are moving. And I don't, there's something I just don't have to explain to you because you've been in a similar socioeconomic st status of country. Let me say that. Yeah. A socioeconomic and development challenging that you face. Um, so when you're like, hey, you know, this place, the roads are bad. Okay, we know why. And people, Africans that know that, they succeed. That's why I would say, Dangote is really a great example of this. And then, you know, go back is that <clears throat> what he did in Zambia, or oh, you said he's in Ghana too? Yeah. I think and he's in Ghana, he's in, I think, he's in Benin Republic. Benin, yeah. He's in, yes, he's in a lot of African countries, somewhat. Yeah. And yeah, that's like. He has the biggest refinery right now, very big refinery in Lagos, Nigeria. And you that's know. government to government. Think about yeah. that's like African to African. Yeah. Yeah. 
So and it's like he's he's because because he gets it. Like for example, if you come to South Sudan, you'll be comfortable. If I go to mm. Lagos or Abuja, I'd be comfortable. Mm. But there's Africans who have money, and there's small projects in Africa that we can invest in that doesn't need a Hawaja. I mean, there's mm. projects that need ten million, fifteen million dollars that can be raised internally. I mean, how many? I, mean, I think you can look this up on the call. How many billionaires are there in Africa? Let's say, who's are there? Yeah. And those, I mean, for example, Dangote's net worth is more than the GDP of my country. Mm. Wow. All right. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's big. And, okay, for example, like, think of a country like South Sudan, Central African Republic, uh, Chad, Mali. Burkina Faso, those are countries who some of their economic challenges can be addressed by mega projects. Like mm. I was saying, in South Sudan, if you can have a mega project like an oil refinery, a dam, a power project, you change the country completely. Mm. And those projects can be financed by Africans. And guess what? That money will stay in Africa. Mm. Right? And that's how it is. And you have Africa and Bank really pushing for more inter Africa trade. And that's the mission that they're being, that they're succeeding on right now. Yeah. But my own problem, you know, my own view, you know, we talk, you know, I, I love the your your view in, on that particular um, subject matter. But I, uh, as an African, you know, also, um, I, I see myself as a Pan-African. And I will tell you something. The major problem of African projects is always maintenance they don't maintain they have that big white elephant project you know there's a state in my country in nigeria you know and i'm going to talk about it but i'm not going to say the name of the state they built an air- airport a very big massive airport i'm not going to say the name a <laughs> uh, million dollar or whatever how much they spend on our airport and can you believe that it's almost a year now or two years no airplane have landed in that airport wow so it's a white elephant project so most of all these things always end up being a white elephant project you know so and you know how it is but if i'm going to ask a question to follow up with this is is there any incentive you know apart from um i know you talked about um um rwanda you talked about rwanda giving making it easier for investors to invest so is there any incentive that government or financial tax break or something that government in African states, let's use South Sudan as a as a subject matter, that they're actually offering investors that okay if you invest, we give you tax break for the first one year. Is there something like that? I you know, I'm just curious to know about that. Yeah, there's something like that in South Sudan. I, I don't know about other countries. Okay. Africa we have another you go to another point. Um, you mentioned white elephant projects, and we have to we have to address that. <laughs> you know, what I mean? you know what I mean, right? <laughs> Some people doing business is looting. Mm. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. right. <laughs> I understand. I understand that fact. Where instead of doing a project, maintaining and making my money, mm. Jay is the governor. He gives me the projects and. You know, it's sad, but, you know. <laughs> but that's why, by the way, we have to address that because many people are hesitant to invest in Africa. They're like, hey, hmm. uh, some people in positions of power are known to ask. Hmm. <laughs> and some of them are known hmm. to say, hey, hmm. do half the work and you'll receive the full payment. Hmm. And make sure that we're receiving hmm. our... <laughs> That's why the point I want to make is that Africa, if you look at it, we have such good laws and policies on paper, but mm. we don't implement them. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. We don't implement them. Um, in South Sudan, we have the South Sudan Investment Promotion Act of 2009. Okay. And this promotion act talks about promoting investment repatriation. It's a very good act. And it says that people are, get tax breaks if you invest. Um You'll get uh, you'll be able to repatriate a hundred percent of the your your capital. The idea is to bring in investment, have projects that impact the economy. But mm-hmm. once again, sometimes these laws and policies are implemented as the way they should be implemented. 
where you have the law on paper, then you have the whole the side deal, the under the table mm-hmm. agreement, um, where hey, make sure that you know where where people certain people are cut in. That happens across, um, like you you say, but investment promotion it has to be through experience. Like you have to have been like, okay, I worked in this country, I like it. Mm-hmm. You should go there too. I mean, kind of the way you see Rwanda has very good investment promotion, registering companies e- e- very easily there, and it's encouraging people. Um, like if you look at the ease of doing business ratings, those are very important ratings. Like people, investors look at those. They really look mm-hmm. at those. Like, okay, how is how do I fit into this? And if you're known as if your ease of business is difficult or higher, you're gonna have some challenges. So now, let's look at the future. You know, we've talked about right now, the current situation right now. So let's look at the future of investing in Africa. Because right now, Africa, the world is getting a little bit of a century. So how yeah. do you see investment landscape? You know, how do you see the investment landscape in Africa in the next decade? How do you see the investment landscape in Africa evolving in the, in the next decade? How do you see that? I see the investment landscape opening up and I see it like us Africans being forced to adjust to it because yeah. um, people, the citizens demand, are going to demand more, investors are going to demand more, and entrepreneurs are going to demand more. And when more different generations of people get into positions of power and positions of influence, they're going to start asking for better. And the investment landscape is that people, Africans now have the skills to do some of these jobs themselves and they're hungry for change. They're hungry mm. for economic change. Like, Africans want to be able to live a good life in their countries, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the same life that you live in New York or in Houston. Why can't you live it in your country? Mm-hmm. Right? You know, people think like that, you know? <laughs> so the investment landscape is changing. Mm-hmm. There's more, there's a demand for robust and accelerated socioeconomic development. I mean, Africans are saying we should be developing quickly, doing a bunch of projects in education and infrastructure and power and energy, agriculture and mining. People are hungry. People are hungry for change. People are hungry for mm. development. People really want to see the money trickle down to the average African. Mm. I mean, that's the, that's the biggest key is, cause is the average African going to benefit? Are they the beneficiaries of all these investment projects? I mean, mm. as a country, you can do build airports all over the all over the country and build roads that lead nowhere. And mm. you'll make money as an infrastructure company, but what impact are you having on the people? Uh, and like you said earlier, the airport that nobody landed there, how much impact did it have on the people? True. Just <laughs> like that. No, no, because the people really don't need that as a then. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, just like we talked about technology, you said some places don't even need technology right now. You need more <laughs> agriculture. What to hit? Mm-hmm. You know, um, some weeks ago, there's one person that was reaching out to the president of Nigeria, you know, where she was just shouting, um, invest more let's have like a, a national um commodity which is cassava he said commodify cassava commodify cassava commodify the nera you know to put more energy in in making cassava becoming our major export because when you export automatically there's going to be money paid in dollars and you have more dollars to convert into nera you know but when you are importing a lot because a lot of most African countries do a lot of import. They have nothing to show for it. They just keep consuming, consuming, you know. Um, I think more African countries need to do a lot of uh, what, what they call production. So if you are an investor, from my own view, if you're an investor and you think you are very good, that you can actually go into Africa and actually tap into this initiative, it's going to be, it's going to help you a lot. That's, that's definite. So if you go into African countries and you understand the landscape and you tap into the government um, policies, because I know a lot of governments always, um, they have this um, an initiative, you know, that they, they give to people, you know, even foreigners, so that they, they would encourage them to want to invest more in that particular sector. So now, um, let me go to you, Doc. Now, it, Using South Sudan as a case study, you know, what specific government incentives or policy, you know, um, that is currently driving investments 
and economic growth in Africa. Like for investors, the, the government um, incentive that, okay, if you do this in South Sudan, maybe if you invest in agriculture, this is what you get. Uh, we're going to make sure your, your, your dollar rate, you know, we, you know, there must be just some incentive they give to investors that, okay, I'm an investor, I want to invest in South Sudan right now, I have a million dollars. So what are the incentives they're going to give me to make sure, you know, my money, I have that, is it tax break? Is it, for, you know, I don't, I don't really want to put words into your mouth because I know you're the expert here. So what, <laughs> what exactly do you think for an investor that want to invest in South Sudan, I'm not saying Africa right now. Yes, Africa, yeah, but South Sudan as a subject matter. Hmm. So what exactly do you think? <laughs> <laughs> tax breaks, okay. For agriculture, the government of South Sudan has a policy that they have abolished all customs and fees on the importation of agricultural equipment and supplies. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's big. That's big. So that's boosted our economy. Mm -hmm. yes. Ah, I mean, if anything you're buying for agriculture or supply, then you're way taxed. Mm. Wow. That's, that's, so basically, that's saying like, hey, this is an important sector for us. Mm. But uh, agriculture is not quick money. Mm. And unfortunately, some people, are, they like the quick money. Mm. <laughs> the quick money, mm. the fast money, is fast money, mm. you know. <laughs> mm. But uh, agriculture is a key sector. Agriculture and fisheries. It's a key sector. And then the government also really, sometimes they subsidize uh, fuel going to farmers. But once again, that fuel goes back to the market sometimes. Hmm. <laughs> you see? Our people sometimes, right? <laughs> Where like you give fuel to farmers to farm hmm. and the farmers hmm. themselves would distribute it and then say, let's go sell hmm. it back to the market. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, but that's the key thing that the government itself has really been trying to do now. The government and people, they, they, everybody has agreed that agriculture is the most important sector that we need to develop by mm -hmm. far. No question asked. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's powerful. So now, um, while we're going to wind up, because you've gotten a lot of information and you've already given us a lot of powerful knowledge. So I'm going to ask you many questions. You know, we are rounding up, but it's still not random. We still, we still have enough time to, you know, talk about um, one or two last thoughts. So what are some common misconceptions or myths about investing in Africa that you would like to debunk today? Well, um, one thing I want to make say, the issue of risk. Um, the reason I when we discussed I like the topic of risk is because risk is everywhere. People say it's risky to invest in Africa. It's risky to invest in America. It's risky to invest in True. China. It's risky to invest in Europe. I mean, imagine in Europe you invested uh, in Europe or like Poland, and then the Ukraine Russia war broke out. Imagine you're an investor in investing in, for example, the Middle East, and you see the mm. tensions that are happening there. Here in America, you have issues. Uh, New True. York City just flooded up. What, a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah, yeah, true, <laughs> true. It's also a risk, mm -hmm. but the global media has really tried to push Africa's risk. Like, oh, you're gonna you're gonna go there, you're gonna be murdered by warlords. They are gonna be. That's why I mentioned in the beginning. There's some risk, but you have to know the landscape. Take the risk. Africans mm -hmm. are taking the risk. That's why an African is more likely to take the risk. Like, so like I, I do farming. So some of the places I farm, people say, oh, it's not safe. I'm like, but what do you mean? It's safe in what context? Uh, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, you know, like. It's just not safe. I'm like, okay, give me reasons how it's not safe or the level of violence or whatever. But anyway, is it really safe? Yes, there are hmm. safe. I mean, here in America, I mean, people get shot in schools. Kids get shot in schools. Hmm. Sure. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't want to say that, but what I want to say is that there's going to be risk in everything that you do. If you, if us as Africans continue to look at the negatives of our countries, the challenges facing countries instead of overcoming them, we're going to stay stagnant. That's why the Chinese have been penetrating Africa more than the Americans, because they take True. that risk. They go to places that people don't True. go. True. Look at them taking the benefits. Mm. They go to rural places. I mm -hmm. mean, you look at China, it's, it's in Central African Republic, it's in South Sudan, it's in yeah. Sudan. Yeah. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. there, there, there are a lot of Chinese in Nigeria. Of course, a lot in the local community that even I might not even go, you know, and they're there. So, which is, you know. You see, and, but they take that risk. 
So yes. that's a myth we need to discuss. Like, oh, African investment is risky. Risky how? Mm-hmm. Determine the country you're going to invest in and, mit- and analyze the risk. Some countries, they don't have rebels and warlords. Some countries, mm-hmm. they don't have coups. Um, mm-hmm. If it's street crime or crime, you have street crime in New York City, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's like there's a risk with everything associated. So it's like we can't wait for Africa to become perfect to work. We have to work to make it perfect. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for that information. So um, if I'm going to add to it, you know, I've always spoken to people about risk. And I said risk is everyday activity. So when you go to bed in the night, it's a risk. You might not wake up. Yes. It's a risk. So having your dinner is a risk. You never know. You can have food poisoning. Water is a risk. Sitting is a risk. Driving is a risk. People have driven mm-hmm. just from one block to another and then never made it back home. So risk is everything, business, wherever it is. So, but you have to take that risk because if you don't take that risk, you end up losing out. You know, I remember when Uber came out and people were like, oh, do you mean I'm going to have somebody I don't know in my car? Is that even sensible? And and Airbnb came out and people were like, oh, you mean I'm going to have somebody come and sleep in my house for just money? Somebody I don't know? It doesn't make any sense. But now, you know... It's popular. Yes, the critical analysis was like, it's a dumb idea, it's a dumb project. And guess what? Now, Airbnb is everywhere. New York, everywhere. You know, you stay in Texas, just call it. Airbnb is there. Uber is there. It's now global. You know, even same thing with Amazon. You know, you mean I'm going to leave the store and buy some imaginary stuff online and they're going to... Yeah, what if it doesn't sound... You know, you know, and these are the things that, you know, has been, you know, drawing us back because we are scared of risk, risk, risk. So the goal of this, um, um, of bringing a very knowledgeable person for this um, episode is to get you to take that risk. Mm-hmm. Make your investment, because a lot of people have been talking about this subject matter, about investing in africa and let's even take out of investment now in investing in africa even investment itself business you have to take that risk don't just be a listener yeah. and just listen to entrepreneurs different entrepreneurs talking about how they started and all that is you have to take that risk because if you don't take it then why are you why are you why do you want to just waste your time from risk to reward investing in africa's economic renaissance so you have to jump on it you have to tap on it so um to round up what resources or um I'm, a question for you um doc what resources or organization would you recommend to investors who are interested in exploring opportunities in africa what organization yes would you recommend like or what resources africa? yes to you know i want to invest now so how do I go about it? Who do I reach out to? I think you can reach out to Jay. <laughs> no, we can talk to our consultant, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so <laughs> they're consultants. So it's open. Reach out to me and Jay, and we'll guide uh, you. We'll talk definitely, to you. Definitely. If you're an investor, reach out to Jay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm here. I'm here anyways if you need to invest in Africa. But I know. think also I would ask them to start studying Africa. I would ask them to study investment reports about Africa. Exactly. Uh, read about... I mean, I would say read about the Africa Bank. They're doing a lot of good work. Uh, it's, a good, mm. it's a big bank, and they've really been penetrating into Africa. They've, they've done some work in South Sudan. They've invested with different companies. They've provided support. So that's somebody to read about. Africa Development Bank is really pushing. Uh, and the president of Africa Development Bank and the president of Africa Bank are both Nigerian. So yeah, imagine. You might know them. <laughs> <laughs> huh? so, which is good. What are your cousins, huh? <laughs> I so, think we have a we have a lot of things on our shoulders as Nigerians, yeah. anyways. And also WTO, wow, you guys are key mm-hmm. places. Mm-hmm. But like, read about Africa trade. Different, like, if you're gonna invest in a certain country, read about that country, study that country, and then reach out to consultants like us who could mm-hmm. connect you with people in different places in those countries. And from there, you grow because Africans as consultants, we have networks. I mean, Jay knows people in Ghana and Nigeria. And where I, I know, know somebody in South Sudan too. And I right know you, South, <laughs> South, you come to us. 
Hmm. Definitely. So, um, it's been a great time with you. You know, we had a long time and it's been fun. And um, I always do one thing, which is um, I sometimes I start it from the beginning, you know, but I want to ask just one question and another last question, which is going to be a takeaway. So can you just in one minute or less than one minute, you know, you being a, a founder, um, the CEO of Oros, correct? Yes, yes. The CEO of Oros uh, Consulting. So how did you get started? You know, most times I ask this from the beginning, but most times I love, you know, you know, um, asking it at the end. So the question is, how did you get it started? What motivated you to be, um, to say, okay, I want to go into consulting. I want to be an entrepreneur. So what motivated you? And what would you tell our listeners that really want to be, um, they really want to be a consultant or they want to be an entrepreneur? What would you have to, you know, what, what are your last words, you know, that you can actually tell them? You know, you can also miss that with um, the last word on investing in Africa. We can make it two, so we can, you can just, the floor is for you. Two minutes, three minutes, just, you know. The I floor mean, is for I'll, you. I'll yeah. brief, I, I've always been interested in investments and private sector development. And I was like, let me just get into the field that I like. So I started with consulting with developing strategies for organizations. So I used to develop strategic plans for organizations. Very boring work. Uh, and so from there, I started to get into for companies and for the companies I liked them. Okay, this is good. You know, like, cause I'm, I'm somebody, I have a background in research and in policy. I'm like, okay, this is what I do researching countries and researching their challenges. Now I get, can do presentations and get paid for it. This is good. And from there, I really started to expand on the investment advocacy. I'm a very active commentator, as you see my interviews on CNBC. Definitely. Yeah. 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 That's great. Podcast. Like I'm out there, uh, I need to get my own podcast, or we need to make a podcast in the future. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Um, um, investing in Africa is just going to be, you um, know, yeah. But I would say my most of my message, I've always been, have that entrepreneur spirit, where as a young age, I realized there's more, because I've always more, I thought more of the polit- political side before, but now I'm starting to see that I can do a lot in the private sector. I can really inspire the private sector. That's why I'm in agriculture. I do logistics, you know, so... I have other companies that do different work, you know, so I have another company in mind that does agriculture and logistics and um, uh, besides consulting, then I one that does, uh, you know, uh, some small construction, civil war, just stuff like that. Like, okay, this is a good opportunity. This is, we need to explore different sectors. So I realized I can do a lot in the private sector. I can create jobs and create opportunities and I can pursue these things. It's just a matter of being disciplined and pursuing it. So my message is any young entrepreneur, be committed and be disciplined to the good days and to the bad days. You have a bad day, get up every day and go at it. Uh, and be positive. Always tell yourself that you, you'll get through it. Yeah, so that's what I'll say. All right, thank you so much. Thank mm-hmm. you so much because that's the word. Because the goal of this podcast is more um, getting winners. It's not just only about investing in Africa because it's just this episode, we might not say much about investing in Africa anymore. But it's just about winner circle. We we have like winners, entrepreneurs too. He is here. He has told you that you can actually get it done. You can, no matter whatever you put your mind into, get it, get it. Don't let anything stop you. Be disciplined. Be disciplined. If you're not disciplined, that's a problem. You know because mm-hmm. that's what drives the entrepreneur. So yes. until next time, um, thank you for listening. Thank you for. Being with us, you know, it's a good show. Thank you so much, Doc, for being on this show. Thank you because, you know, it's not easy to have somebody give <laughs> them, you know, this word, this encouraging and yes. intelligent word. Thank so, all right, you, guys. All right, uh, guys. All right, see you next time. Remember, you're a winner. So stick to the winner circle. All right, have a nice day. Get started. This is the same building of the Edward